message. I'm glad that you've chose to join with us to the church family. So glad that you are joining with us tonight. And I trust and pray as we come to study God's word, it'll encourage us, it'll guide us, it'll direct us, it'll teach us. Also, we welcome our special guests that will come and share this time with us. And it's so important, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we stay in the Word of God, that we feast upon the Word of God, that we pray the Word of God in these perilous times. But one comfort we have, God's in charge. God's in charge. But tonight, I want to speak to you on a message entitled, The Christian's Discipleship is based upon four laws. Notice that. Discipleship has four laws. I want you to look at chapter 17 and beginning in verse number 1. Now it's very important naturally all through the Bible. But we know as we've studied before that Christ spoke to his disciples when there was a teaching that he personally wanted to instruct them in. And such as this case, when it comes to discipleship, the Lord taught his disciples what these four laws would be. Notice in verse 1, then said he unto his disciples. So these laws apply to those that have trusted Christ, who have purposed in their heart and made that discipleship to be an important part of their life and have a desire to serve the Lord, have a desire to be all that God can use them for. So the Lord wanted his disciples to know these four laws that required of being that disciple. Number one, leading another person to sin brings judgment. Look at it. It is impossible that offenses will come. I mean, because we live in a sinful world, we dwell among sinful people. We ourselves are sinful people, saved by the grace of God. It's impossible to prevent all offenses when it becomes to being a disciple. Notice what he says, though. Notice what he says. But woe unto him through whom they come. The teaching of the Bible throughout the New Testament, starting with the Lord's instruction, all the way through the remainder of the New Testament, the importance of understanding how powerful and how important it is to demonstrate that new creature in Christ. How important it is to, to ask God to conform you to the image of Christ, to give you the mind of Christ, for the power that you have to go forth as a light shining in a dark world. He said, pay attention. Notice that what he said, whoa, whoa. Now we know sin is inevitable. We know offenses will come, but notice what he said, leading others to be involved in sin is terrible in the sight of God. And there are ways that we can be guilty of this. First of all, carnality, God forbid, or being self-righteous, or being ill-prepared in the Word of God to instruct others. He said, whoa, how many people have been run off from the cause of Christ 
by a zealous believer who did not have proper knowledge. The Bible said that we ought to be able to give the answer for the reason of the hope that abides within us. Oh, how important it is to know the Bible before you begin to share the Bible, lest you become offensive to somebody. And then think, what a horrible, horrible example was Lot. Just plain old back out into carnality. Throw caution to the wind and allowed that flesh to once again rule his life. And Jesus himself said, a man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Jesus is warning the disciples, you've got to understand how important it is to be that new creature in Christ. Think about it. How much self-righteousness and ill preparation of the scripture has deterred or run off or legalism legalism how many people has it destroyed their walk with christ and then of course carnality carnality look at it and notice what he said in fact he said it's so condemned instead of being guilty of this look at verse number two he doesn't mince words with how costly it can be look what he says it were better for him that a millstone was hanged about his neck now we know the millstone was used in the grind mill to grind the grain sometimes they could be up to 400 pounds he said it'd be a lot better that that was just dangled around your neck and you were drowned look at it look at it and he cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. An offense is that which you cause someone else, someone else pain and making a bad defense, a bad decision. That's how important it is. It's what's alarming today is because of the casual, contemporary, convenient spirit that we have our light has went out. Our light burns very dimly. And we brought about a false concept of Christ. You see, salvation, ladies and gentlemen, is not that license to sin. It's liberty to present to a lost world, a dying world, that in Christ, there's victory. In Christ, there's joy. In Christ, there's completion. He himself said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Think about that. God left the believer in the world to be that light, to shine in the dark world. But if we walk in carnality, if we walk in legalism and self-righteousness we bring nobody to christ we deter them from coming to christ we discourage them in their growth period remember especially new born again christians they don't have a knowledge they're immature how many have failed to understand the awesome responsibility power that God has invested in one that's a believer to make sure that they keep the faith they keep the faith they contend for the faith notice that he said very plainly oh listen I know offenses are inevitable but let those offenses not be on purpose let them be not a part of our life what an awesome, awesome thought it is to stand before God one day and say, you stood between somebody coming to Christ or serving Christ. 
one of the sadnesses I've seen in ministry is how many young believers have been badgered, misdirected, and caused to throw down their call to God because of improper instruction or because of someone trying to convince them of their convictions, of their lifestyle, or their pattern of belief. The Bible said we're new creatures in Christ. We're not to have people conform to our image, God forbid. We're to help them be conformed to the image of Christ by seeing Christ in us. Think about it. How costly the cause of Christ has been for those two types of believers. That carnal believer. That carnal believer that refuses to come out of the world and be a separate and touch not the unclean thing. And then how about that self-righteous having a former zeal but denying the power thereof. They have set up their standard, their convictions for someone else to follow. And that's impossible. God help us realize, ladies and gentlemen, we've got an awesome responsibility. And unless we cause them to fail, we will stand before God. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you're not going to be conformed to the image of Christ, and I'll have some people disagree with me, then don't try to convince people that you are a child of God when you deny it before your behavior. Don't confuse people. Don't you remember how Paul rebuked Peter because of the confusion when he was with a Gentile, he acted like a Gentile. When he was with a Jew, he acted like with a Jew. He said, you're causing confusion. You're causing people to be confused. And that's what the modern day Christian at large has done and is doing. Causing confusion. The Bible said, come out from the world and be a separate and touch not the unclean thing. In the world, but not of the world. You made a decision. When you got saved, you said, I'm not my own. I'm to glorify God. I've been bought with a price. How dare us to go back on that or misuse it. Then secondly, in verse number three and four, the second law of discipleship is forgiving everyone is absolutely necessary. If, if you do not have the gift of forgiveness until God gives it to you, you can never be a disciple. You can never be. So if you don't have that gift, you'll never be the disciple that Christ expects you. Because notice what he said, take heed to yourselves. And you remember what he said before? He said, if you don't forgive others, then the Father won't forgive you. But notice what he said about forgiveness. It's unconditional. And there's no time frame in which it runs out. Forgiveness is to be a constant attitude of the believer who's been forgiven. Think about it. Stop and think about it. God forgave you. And he's continuing to have to forgive you. If we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth's not in us. God is continually, unconditionally, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How dare us not to share that with others? How dare us to think that's only applicable to me? Only applicable to me. Look what he said. Take heed to yourselves. When you refuse to forgive, the first thing you've done is you forgot that you were forgiven. You were forgiven. How dare you? How dare me? Not to extend that same gift of forgiveness. Know what he said. If thy brother trespass against thee, and it's going to happen, 
There are going to be people in your life that are going to sin against you. Some on purpose, some through ignorance. But regardless, notice what it says. Rebuke him. If you have all against the brother, go be reconciled. Don't come with a, a spirit of retaliation, condemnation. Come with a genuine desire to get that resolved. And you do that by first of all, instead of condemning and accusing and retaliating, pause for a moment and say, what part did I have in this? What, what did I do that caused you to behave or think about me that way? You see, conflict resolution, based upon the pattern of Jesus, is that two people sat down, identify their precept of the offense, and come to compromise from both to accept a acceptable conclusion to that problem. Look at it. He said rebuke him. Now he didn't mean go fight him. He didn't mean go uh, curse him. He didn't mean to, to, to be mean toward him. Go and ask what did I do that caused you to react the way you did to me. And you should give that same gift to somebody else. If they come to you and say. I want to know. What I did. That caused. You. Or me. To treat you that way. Look at it. And notice what he said. And if he repent. Forgive him. Forgive him. Notice. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day. That doesn't mean the same sin, ladies and gentlemen. That doesn't mean the same times. Notice what the Bible said. Again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Think about it. Remember when Peter asked, well, how often shall I forgive my brother? And the Lord said, 70 times seven. Now this is truth. There was a lady who asked me one time. Well, that means 490. So after 490 times, I can quit forgiving. I said, no. And I didn't rebuke her. How un unkind that would have been. I said, no, ma'am. What that means is there's no limit to forgiving. There's no time in life that you'll ever arrive that you no longer have to forgive others. Until... You leave this world and stand before Christ in that new glorified body. As long as you live on this earth, there's the possibility and probability that there'll be those that you need to forgive. So forgiveness is unlimited. What if God give it a limit on forgiving us? Well, you know, preacher, now you've used up all your forgiveness. You're, you used it all up. I got no more for you. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. I would be without hope. I would be without joy. I would be devastated because I do need, I will need forgiveness until I stand before Jesus. Even though my sin debt has been paid, as far as my condemnation, my life is still being tested and I'll answer for it. Notice what he says there. He said, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Well, the third law is having faith is essential. You see, they said, increase our faith. Now let me say, and I'll go before you can go to Romans chapter 12. God has dispersed to every person the amount of faith they need. It's not that a believer needs more faith. What a believer needs to do is to ask God how to use their faith, how to mature their faith, 
how to strengthen their faith, and how to help them stand on their faith. God's give you that. Look what he said. Look what he said. And the Lord said, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it shall obey you. See, they didn't need more faith. What they needed was to know how to use it. That's the purpose of testings and trials. That's the outcome of the testings and trials we go through. Because faith is not purified by fire. It's knowledge only. A lot of people say, even James said, I, a lot of people say, I have faith, but he said, I'll show you my faith. Faith is nothing but knowledge until it's been tested. And since God can't bless us without faith, He must keep our faith in order. Current. Faith can't be stored up for today. Well, I'm going to store my faith up for today because I might need it tomorrow. Faith is a daily use. Faith cannot be stored up. It's like manna. You must take every day what you needed. You must have the faith that God gives you matured and usable every day. Every day. And notice that. One of the most powerful forces in the world is faith. God said, if you really believe me, there's nothing you can't do that I ask you to do. There's no obstacle that you can't overcome. There's no valley you can't go through. There's no task. Let me remind you once again. Moses' faith was demonstrated when God said, lift your rod. And see the salvation of the Lord. See, he had the faith. He just didn't know how to use it. But when he asked God, when he asked God, see, when you ask God for a certain trial or tribulation, God then can start to mature your faith. You have it already. But you don't know how to use it. Then fourthly, in closing right quick, verses 7 through 10, the fourth law is obeying God is not a duty it's a privilege. Once you fail to realize, if you get into the mindset, well, my service to God is a duty, it is not. It is not. It is a privilege to serve God. Look what he says. But which, but which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. You see, the illustration here he has is a servant is really a slave who serves the master. It's his service notice to serve all day, to serve all evening. It will not rather say unto him, make ready when I may sup and girt thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Look at it. The real obeying God involves serving all day, serving all evening, serving till all others have retired, to serve whether or not one is thanked or appreciated. Doth he thank that the servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I throw not. You see, listen. Listen. If you're only willing to serve God when you're recognized, when you get the glory, then it's not service. Notice what he said here in closing. Notice what he said very plainly. Verse 10. So likewise ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done but that which was our duty to do. You see, the believer is to serve and obey until all God's commandments are done. The believer is to be humbly 
humbly, willing to offer his service to the Lord, not looking for what he may get out of it. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Law number one, the danger of leading another person to sin brings the judgment. Law number two, forgiving all is essential. Law number three, having faith is essential because without faith you cannot please God. And then law number four, obeying God is a duty, not a service. We owe it to the Lord to serve Him. God help us to understand the awesome privilege and responsibility of being a servant. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Pay attention to what your life is. Pay attention to the example that you're showing to your own family. These past two or three months has been an opportunity to show our family who we really are in God. What kind of assessment have we received? Well, we don't go to church no more, so we don't have to really worship. We don't really have to pray. We don't really have to read our Bibles. We don't really have to tithe. We don't really have to watch the messages that God's sending our way. I mean, you know, uh, we can just sit back and take it. Or you continue with the dedication because of the privilege God has given you. You should be more of an example during these crises than just that normal. Just that normal. Then perhaps you have an un forgiving issue in your life and you wonder why you have no joy or no desire to even serve the Lord. You got to address that. And you say you have faith, but you're proven by the very action during this period of time. Your faith is nothing but knowledge. Then law number four, obeying God is the only way. Remember what David come to a conclusion after all that he got into? To obey God is better than sacrifice. Father, we bow in your presence. Forgive us tonight in our failure. Anoint the sermon. Prepare it and apply it to the hearts of everybody as it'll bring glory and honor to you. Help us to understand we are in a position that's going to show up in eternity. Help us to realize that awesome responsibility and privilege and duty and service it is to serve you. Speak to every heart. That person that joined us tonight that's not saved, help them to know that Jesus loves them and that's why he went to the cross. That's why he shed his blood because it was the only sacrifice the Father would accept. And he's ready to offer that to whosoever will. So that person that's under the sound of our voice that's not saved, help them bow and confess their sin, accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior and be born again for that child of God that's grown weary, become discouraged, or thought it's not really necessary because I'm not a witness before anybody. I'm kind of on my own self, so it's not really. Let me say to you again in kindness, we're not who we are in public. We are who we are in private. Are we utilizing this time to show our families our real faith is in God? Father, bless now, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Until we meet again, may God bless you.